go. Um, but uh, let's get rolling. Punctual as ever. Uh, so, um, we just wanted to kind of go back through what we've learned, uh, spend some time with Lee, um, give you a little snapshot of the overview of the business of Adapted itself. Won't go too deep into that, but just give you a little orientation. Uh, and then let Brad and, and, and Ann really kind of talk through the solution. Um, and then keep this active. Ask questions, take you told me this, that type of stuff. This is really how these things are most effective because you kind of know how you do it today. And if you've seen Hyperion and you've seen Cognos and stuff like that, a lot of those things are familiar. I think you'll find a much more easy to use platform. And that's just the kind of the premise when Ralph Hall founded this business in 2003. He was a CFO four times over. He had built companies. He knew the marketplace of Hyperion, Cognos, business objects, really IT intensive, funky legacy. He's like, you know what? Sales is coming out. These cloud based SaaS platforms are now kind of really starting to take hold. And then this is 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he, he saw the, the light and raised a bunch of capital. And the first product came out in 2007. We had 37, 38 like, upgrades. They did about three to three a year. Uh, so really, it's always been cloud first from day one, but always about built by a CFO, designed by a CFO for finance and broader. So, um, Understand your business a little bit. So video platform kind of competing on the enterprise kind of webcast space um, for large meetings, um, large organizations. Uh, you've also got like RSM, as you mentioned. That, I've actually brought up the idea that I'm, you know, we'll see where that goes. But revenue planning, we're looking at really a, a, hot, a mix of product and SaaS or such subscription and staff and, and event-based revenue streams for about 60% and 40% around uh, professional services. Anything unique and challenging uh, in your point of view on uh, kind of revenue planning that... Um, I'm that's a five-hour conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <But> yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then driving the cost of the sg &A and stuff like that, whether it's hosting costs, dev costs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that happens with a tech company, marketing, sales, all that. I mean, this is a ubiquitous end-to-end, -end, wall to wall planning platform uh, and analysis and, and reporting. So, it, it, um, so the reporting talked about one of the opportunities here because of the ease of use is getting more people self-service. Instead of saying, hey, can you show me what's behind this number? Can you help me understand can I, can I spend this money or not? Give non-financial users certain access to be able to see their budget see their forecast, let them kind of manage their hires, if they're doing hires, hey, and, and really engage them and, because they're making decisions and you're picking up pieces. Yeah. Whereas if they actually had more touch and they can actually put, I, I can also put notes in and explain what's going on, it can really help with collaboration and optimize the amount you guys are spending your resources. Um, full financial statements, k and balance sheet, cash flow. Um, oh, that's right on top of our current geo. Yeah, exactly. So it integrates uh a couple of slides that I mean, but yeah, so NetSuite used to OEM adapted. And so when they bought the Oracle, they don't OEM it again as their kind of forecasting budget and planning reporting platform, but there's still a, there's at least eight hundred clients that still use it and more are are just saying, you know, this is easy to use. Right? Hyperion Cloud is really it's Hyperion and it's complex and it's it's not the value proposition. Um, I wasn't saying either Cognos or Hyperion, but they're super complicated. Yeah, and, and most businesses aren't even that complicated. Most <coughs> businesses don't have the IT resources. So, so I mean, it'll be a full like team company. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, the previous R1 and RCM, right? Uh, the rebrand? Yes, right. Yeah, right. Rebrand. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I know we ran a couple years ago now. Yeah. Right. Uh, I was there. I was there when all that when they got re-audited, and I was doing all that stuff. Uh, that must have fun. So we can bring data into any, any system. Most people are bringing data from three to five. Some people either kind of hard coded the integration, which would be from NetSuite, and maybe financial reports if that makes sense. But others are just like it's easy import export temp, uh, platform to so bring templates in. So HR roster. Um, if you want to bring Salesforce in and kind of, some of those are 
you know, it's easy enough to do it 10 to 15 minutes to upload. So it's not so if it's really active data, you, you do an integration. If it's not, if it's once a month, you just have a good process to get clean data out of your native system and bring it over. So heard that sales planning is a challenge. Um, it, it takes the was it Rujal, um, Rujal, 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 a lot of time. Uh, finance and fix up the pieces to update the spreadsheets, create a financial plan. You're doing a lot of forecasting. Um, and so uh, staff metrics, you guys, we were back down here. Uh, staff metrics being more important as you think about going for financing. And they, those are really kind of the things that drive value. Uh, CAC and LTV and the Rule 40 and, and those type of things. So, uh, that's that's a pretty nice uh, native functionality that Japs has been building into the product. So just about adaptive. Um, 3,700 customers they crossed the 100 million dollar mark for ARR, which is a pretty big step for uh, um, cloud based businesses. Always been modern uh, technology uh, architecture. Always it's multi tenant in memory. So you make a change in an assumption. The models up to date. You're not batching, you're not going to get coffee, anything like that. And full audit trails. So if you do start democratizing access, you know who changed what when. So if you give your CEO access, and, and you can create custom versions for others if you want to have a lockdown budget and say, hey, they're not that reliable for the year, but then we're going to do iterative forecasts. You can keep those open and you can give people their own versions, or you can say, hey, you know what? Um, work on it. This is the working forecast for the next week. Put your sales forecast in, update your hiring, update your capital plan, your projects, all the things that are the economics of the business. And then you'll know who changed what when. Yeah. Previous value, current value, you never find that effort in itself. That's why you can't share a spreadsheet. Um, so, uh, why are these companies using adaptive? Why are over 500 software companies using adaptive? Why are 800 NetSuite clients and great brands uh, using Adaptive. And, and there's a good strong user community in Chicago, Dialogtech, Relativity, and you go on and on. Um, you're getting your, your entire ecosystem um, and, and your entire business model in one place. Bring your actuals over, being able to kind of, you can now not only bring uh, trial down over, you can actually bring transactions over. So if you really want to drive self-service, people need to know what's under the actual so they can really, hey, is it a timing difference or is it actually incremental spend? Um, but but you're getting your revenue plan going. Um, if you have recurring revenue and you get cash up front and you want to balance your cash model to your uh, gap model, you can actually put timing in. And so here we're getting 100%, we're getting an annual subscription, but we've got a 12-month revenue recognition. and uh, make that easy to do. Um, you can have all your renewals and stuff and, and, and that and actually help maybe the sales side get ahead of the renewals, especially the material ones. Um, if you have some capacity support, they say based on this growth, we're going to need this many people and customer success, um, commissions, expense, uh, all the standard SaaS, board, uh, and then metrics. And then on the other side, I mean, this is a very ubiquitous. Your, your whole professional service side of the business can be managed here. So resource planning, different rates for different projects. You have some maybe fixed fees, some maybe P and M projects. All that can be modeled. Um, and so uh, you've got the forecasting and planning, budgeting, KPIs, reports, uh, and then integration uh, back into core systems. And, and the whole value proposition is. Get out of the lumpy, static, one-time event, outdated from day one, difficult to update, different files. That just, there's no single version of the truth what's going on. You don't know if, like, okay, is that really the most recent Salesforce update that you're loading in and looking at? Uh, you're like, okay, I know exactly what's coming in. I can run multiple versions. I know which which versions and what what is I'm going to do. You have uh, frequent update your business inputs, whether it's your kind of plans, plan hires, compensation scenarios, you're looking at model forward looking at EBITDA and such. Give everybody a common platform and then it's easy to consolidate, easy to roll up. Okay, here's our service business, here's our product business. If you want to start looking at five industry verticals, you start thinking about go-to-market, pharma, tech, professional services, other dimensions that you may find your business, that it is a dimensional 
multidimensional relational database. And so you can tag accounts. Uh, you put your map, your chart of accounts right here, your receptor org structure uh, here. But if you want to tag accounts by maybe size of business or there are other things that might be alternative ways you analyze. Are there any alternative ways you analyze the business today? Yeah. Uh, we do. I mean, there's, there's a ton of So we're always changing. So I think what they might do is it's tough to do it in the static. Yeah. yeah, and, and, and do make it with people. So the, the, the real story is how do you spend more time analyzing the business and less time just making sure the data, the, the data adds up. Yeah, so that's the headline. Any, anything uh, that you want to? I just had a question. Um, where is, I know this is something Nick's looked at, um, and as we sort of build out our, our commission model is a, is a little different. As I'm sure most companies are, and mm -hmm. uh, everyone's got their own commission models, but right now they're doing it manually, and so we do run into some issues in terms of getting salespeople visibility, and we've had demos with, I forget what the next one, exactly, and other sort of commission-focused SaaS solutions. So I'm just curious where that, like, you know, I saw that as one of the circles in that big circle map thing, uh, but. Is, do people use Adaptive for full-on commission calculations, or is it more of just reporting on commissions, or what, what level of complexity can Adaptive handle on the commission side? And, and, the, and the most basic thing is you're in Excel, you can do an Adaptive. Okay. And you can have higher data integrity uh, from the starting point. Okay. Now, we have to look at what you're doing, and, and does it really make sense? I mean, how many sales people are you trying to grow to as well? We have 10. We have, yeah, we have like 12. So, so a tool like exactly might be overkill. That's what we look at. Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, they really thought really, so they couldn't even do like our, the way we have commissions. Okay. Like, would, like, there's just, it's too many unique right. item perimeter before, for everything, for every top every salesperson. Yeah. yeah. And we, we can get into that. Yeah, it's it's just, just, I'm just curious as to like what level people use adaptive for commission. And or Brian, or, or I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that um, on the commission side from what you've seen in other. Um, I think that Brad can talk to that in the demo as far as, um, you know, how many of our customers are using it for commissions and how they're using it. I think I, I'll take that as a, uh, an action item, a follow-up. Maybe we can uh, get a couple of use cases to share. Yeah, you know, and, and this is Brian on the Armanino the team with Sam. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> what, what we're always recommending, like Sam was saying, is keep it integrated, keep it connected. To your, to your model. I mean, in adaptive, as Brad will show you, you know, you can do all kinds of what if logic, you know, type of assumptions and tear breaks and that kind of thing. Obviously, if you get to a whole nother level of, of detail, sometimes that requires a, a commission specific platform. But typically, what we've seen is that fits pretty well within your adaptive model, um, is really what we'd recommend. All right, so Brad, why don't I uh, pass the baton to you? And so, actually, I have a right. quick question. Yep. So we were talking about you were still talking about how uh, revenue side. Now, and this, so would this would this platform be talking back and forth with NetSuite then? So Absolutely. Like, okay. Okay. Yeah. So this integrates natively. You net you, you bring all your actuals over, and so you can actually do your actual reporting plus your forward looking. That's that's what. Uh, how everybody uses it, whether you and whether you're using NetSuite, Intact, Oracle, SAP, QuickBooks, it's agnostic to what the accounting system is. Mm -hmm. you, you map the chart of accounts, and then if you add a new account, this will let you know when you're doing a, a, a data upload. You say, hey, here's the map, a mapped account. Where do you want us to go? Is it revenue? Is it expense? Where, where are you going to transfer? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. All right. You got a good view of the uh, Welcome to Adaptive Suite, Adaptive News page here? Yep. We see a lot of okay. the So you log in. Okay. Uh, yep. Yep. Okay. Very good. All right. So since we were on that vein, let me hit that integration just really quickly to give you an idea of how that data would come in. Let me start there real quick. So 
from the multiple sources that I've heard you discussing, we have a great view of all of these sources here today. Right. So if we look to the right hand side, we see that this would be our data designer from an integration perspective. Typically, we would see our customers set these direct integrations up. You have the option for Excel flat files, but with the sources you have, depending upon the frequency that you need that data updated, you can schedule that via direct integrated connections. Right. So here we have multiple source data, whether it's NetSuite data or Salesforce data, we have the ability to bring all of this data in. Okay, and from NetSuite data on an actual side, your real challenge with NetSuite, and I was a NetSuite user with Adapted as well, I'm guessing you have a lot of the saved searches is where you're trying to do your reporting out of today within NetSuite. Would that be accurate? It's funny you say that. Uh, you know, we, we went to NetSuite probably in 2012. I don't think we really, uh, you know, we have one user, our, my assistant control has been around since then. And in all honesty, you know, you can jump in if you feel differently, but we didn't do a very good job of building out and utilizing all of NetSuite's functionality. And so we had, we dealt with NetSuite over the last year and really pushed them to help us out from a reporting perspective. And that's really right. pushing us to save searches. And we don't really have anyone right now who's um, done a lot of save searches. So. I wish the answer to your question is yes, but unfortunately, I think the answer is probably no. But we know that that's right. sort of the direction we should be going with that suite. If we okay. don't have it, we'll let it happen. And, and that, that's perfectly understandable. And that's kind of, because when I was, I've been an adaptive user at two different companies in the FDNA space in the Dallas area. That's 20 plus years of my background. Uh, we actually transitioned from Oracle to NetSuite. Same vein, we didn't use a lot of them at first, <clears throat> but when we did, that becomes your playing field. And if you get to that point with Adaptive where you have some saved searches from the accounting side, we have, in this, the saved searches in, uh, in NetSuite are really about the customized dimensions that you can access in uh, NetSuite, right? Because typically standard dimensions would be six or eight dimensions. The saved searches, <clears throat> excuse me, allow you to get to the customized dimensions. We have the ability to access all of those customized dimensions in those saved searches. And here you can see the ability for us to import your specific type of saved searches. So if you get to that point where you have some developed saved searches, that is really where your customized dimensions and your data aggregation comes from. We can actually import that saved searches. The vast majority of our competitors aren't going to be able to get to those customized dimensions within that suite. This is where we could attach this you specific feel like report. That building out a robust set of safe searches is a necessity to to sort of fully utilizing uh, adapter. No, it, it's it's certainly not a necessity. We just see a, a large portion of our customer base that have been existing NetSuite users and its broader functionality yeah. are using the safe searches today. So we'll just bring those in from them. Okay. But, if you're not using the saved searches, we also have the option to bring in multiple data sets depending upon the cubes in that suite that you're hitting. Okay, so this would be a case. Notice if we wanted to bring in actual, say, trial balance data of essentially at any month end period. Notice on the left hand side here, <clears throat> we're actually hitting the trial balance data tables that would reside in NetSuite, which is what we would ping and schedule to bring that respective data set, whether it's your income statement data, expense statement uh, data, revenue, balance sheet, cash flow data, all of that data could come from these respective data tables in NetSuite. Okay. And then if it's project level data, right, secondary data set would be considered a secondary import, we would have that set up and then we would hit the project level tables to pick that data out of NetSuite here to do secondary imports on your project level data as well. And I think some of that may be held in financial force based on discussions that I previously had with Sam. Would that be correct? Your time tracking is coming through financial force, not necessarily NetSuite. It would be the same thing. We could hit this data from financial force as well. Okay. Okay. So these would be where we would attach to the data sources themselves, giving us the ability to take here is how it would come in from NetSuite, and then we would regroup it into the respective dimensions into adaptive, 
and then we would set up respective loaders. Loaders would be where we're actually determining where that data would land. So from a project level perspective, we would land it to a specific operational sheet, which in your, this case would be a project planning sheet where we would dump that data into. And then we could set up a specific task. I'm sorry, not a task. Uh, uh, yeah, the task would set up a specific uh, date and time that we could load that and schedule it to run. Project data, maybe you're bringing that in once a week, where trial balance data, maybe you're bringing it, bringing it in once a month or something. Okay. okay. So just wanted to give you a line of sight into integration since we were talking about that in your multiple source systems seemed very much in line with what I could show you here as well, okay, including that Salesforce data for, data for bookings, values, and opportunities based on where they're at their life cycle stage today. So what I guess, and uh, I'll stop asking questions because I really like to see the functionality. But, no, please, uh, please ask what, questions. This is meant, well, this is meant uh, for you. We, uh, want, uh, we want you to get the benefit. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so, you know, like naturally, for instance, they tell us, hey, you can use, we can integrate with your bank, or we can bring in your bank feed, and then they'll tell us, so we put it there, and we'll say, yeah, that seems great, and then they're like, oh yeah, well that's extra, and that's, you know, an extra module. So it's, it's helpful as we go through this to get a sense of what is that, what, what, what comes with adaptive out of the box, so is it, okay, with adaptive out of the box, you get one integration, or, you know, you get one integration via flat file, but not the integrations that we're seeing here. Um, like what is standard integration functionality? So, so out of the um, box, uh, yep, let me uh, so, jump in. Um, oh, go ahead. I mean, either way. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to. All right, so just, you know, with, uh, the, there is manual integration that's typically part of the implementation, and that comes with the base uh, solution. If you are going to automate your integration, as Brad is talking about here, then there is an integration platform that will, there will be an additional cost for that. Um, it's not a user-based uh, cost, it's just a one-time, or not a one-time, but an annual, you know, just a platform cost, and that would enable you to automate with unlimited data sources, NetSuite, Salesforce, uh, Financial Force, you know, any other uh, system where you want to bring data in from. So it's really kind of one or the other. And some folks start with the manual, kind of live with that for a little while, and then move to the automated. Some folks do the automated integration right up front. And then if you go the automated route, is there a limit on, like, the number of times you can press the button? Or, like, if I press the button every day, and say, okay, at the end of every day, I want my NetSuite and my uh, Salesforce and my financial force all come in every day. Uh, we, have, we have some clients stop getting here every 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, most of our I, I would prefer, like, I come from sort of real time, and obviously that would be my ideal state. Now, obviously, I'd have to look at dollars and see what the difference is. But there's no, there's no, there's no data cost. There's no number of times you run it cost. It's literally, we're going to build it without the integration. Yeah. Because we don't have the integration uh, until afterwards, until the model stuff down a little bit, and you've got to know exactly what you're bringing in. And so you don't want to do all those if you don't want to configure a platform and reconfigure and then reconfigure. Great. So we're going to build it with just the the native manual upload with templates. And you and, and as Ann said, a lot of clients live with that and say, you know what, it's, not, it's, it's fine. Others are like, you know what, I want to go to that daily upload and I don't you know, want next to yeah. daily uploads. Um, and, and that's when they go to the integration platform. But you can run it. If you own the platform, schedule it, you can run it as often as you want. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's, let's roll into the, the platform. Yep. yep, yep, very good. All right, wanted to get that out of the way. Okay, so the first thing that comes <clears throat> important for any SaaS business, and I came from a SaaS, uh, SaaS organization that was equity owned as well. Uh, first thing I want to show you is some visual analytics, right? So we do have the ability, do you measure yourself on benchmarks, whether it's employee size, revenue size, compared to other SaaS-based organizations, whether they're similar to your size or into the size that you intend to grow in, where you're measuring yourselves against common benchmarks across the industry? Uh, you know, we have some common benchmarks that we're looking towards. We, we are a pure SaaS company at this point. I'd say, again, we're probably right. half and half. And so it's tough for us 
One of the challenges we have is, you know, I'm sort of pushing it kind of maybe to the benchmarks where I measure ourselves in, but it's hard to sort of, uh, without a bifurcating the business, it's hard to sort of uh, measure ourselves on those metrics. So uh, it's a long way, long-winded way to answer questions they know. I mean, I, I, we, we have, we know what the benchmarks are, and we'd like to, but we need to start with sort of bifurcating the business out. Right. 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 Okay. All right. Very good. All right. So that may not be as important to you. Just something to uh, keep in the uh, keep in your back pocket. We do have the ability to compare your existing actual results to similar size companies for a benchmarking exercise via data that we use from OpEx Engine out of the Boston area. Okay. Got it. Uh, from a have those benchmarks or that in our head, those benchmarks built in. Right. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a business partner. Yeah, 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 exactly right. Okay. Now, this would be an example. Some of these may be applicable to your environment, some way not. We've got multiple different type of metrics that are important to a SaaS or technology environment that we may measure ourselves against budget to actual plan, right? Here would be some typical metrics that we would use from an adaptive perspective at our corporate office, and then we see other SaaS companies using around uh, uh, the metrics that they're measuring themselves by, whether they're new and upsell versus churn, ending ARR metrics, and we just have the ability to display these in multiple visual dial types, right? Customer acquisition costs are huge in uh, technology environments, so we have the ability to measure sales and marketing as a percentage of revenue, customer acquisition costs, whether it's new ARR, divided by sales and marketing, or even new logos, and then lifetime uh, costs as well, okay? Cash perspectives are always huge in smaller, growing environments, so we always want to keep our thumb on where our cash, because really our cash allows us to invest back into our business, our products, and our people to continue our growth patterns. So we just have multiple visual ways produce these dials in a visual analytic perspective, right? Those of us in finance are comfortable with the data sets and tabular views of Excel table data. Some other folks may not, they may be more visual in nature and prefer visual analytics. You being a headcount heavy uh, organization with your professional services side, an HR type dashboard may be important to you as well to see where we are from a headcount measurement perspective at any given time. In this case, we're showing it by respective operating unit. This data could be displayed any way you wanted to display it that's most important to your organization. Okay. Um, marketing pipeline data from a sales perspective, if we're using those leads that are coming in through the pipeline funnels, we could display those as well. <clears throat> Even work through these uh, waterfall type charts where we may start with the actual budgeted number of leads anticipated of 1.9 for any given period, where in Q2, and we're walking through the actual results, which may have been 1.4, and we're seeing where the delta resided within our lead funnel based on the type of lead, right? <clears throat> so the measurements that we would use around these visual views is only limited by the dimensions and the data sets that you're capturing around, in this case, the marketing and pipeline funnel environment today. Okay. Does this look like something of interest to you guys or the visual analytic views or? Yeah, no, no, I think this is huge. I mean, we, you know, you mentioned board packs, and I think that that was another uh, section of your, the, 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 Page before this, but but this is you know Nick spends a lot of time going through stuff like this and you know making sure that the data behind it is correct. So, so this is definitely something we use, but again we do it in Excel and that means all PowerPoint and stuff like that. Yeah. So we'll probably show at the end, but there's a thing called um, Office Connect. Yeah. So you so the ability that then if you if your board loves your package and you're not going to get away from the package. The question is how do you advance the production and, and, you, and improve the data quality? Well, you hyperlink Excel through a product called the Office Connect, which is part of the product that's gotten at another cost. And it allows you to, every month, automatically update that board package. 
So you're doing basically dynamic and linked to your actual business coming from that suite, to your updated forecast, because that's the, the version or the debt or the budget. You push a button, all the dial, everything. If it's tabular, if it's PowerPoint, if it's Word doc, all updated, then you can go through and review yeah. and say, okay, what's the story? Uh, yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good way to put that, Sam. Yep, so that's, that's exactly right. And I could hop to that. What I do want to show you here is these dashboards, if we set them up, you know, properly, these could be run as a presentation mode as well, right? You could just plug in your PC here and run an entire presentation right from your actual dashboards themselves as well, right? That's a pretty slick option as well. Okay. Now, to Sam's point, you know, he was talking about uh, <coughs> Office Connect and the ability to use an existing formatted board report package that you're pr producing in Excel today. You know, in my experience, your executives are comfortable with those. They've been looking at this same pack probably a couple of years now, right? You're discussing page two, and they're half the time they're on page 10 looking for the metric that impacts their respective responsibilities, right? So I've got a pack here. We've got 10 or so tabs, but notice I've got some accounts that are unpopulated. So if I highlight these accounts, and this is an Excel workbook, right? We've got Excel formulas over here. The elements panel that would be very similar to adaptive is on the left-hand side, right? So this element panel is standard, whether we're creating a dashboard view from those visual analytics, creating a formula in adaptive, or updating a report like this, or even our HTML reports, it's the exact same element panel, okay? So this would be our chart of accounts that would mirror your existing chart of accounts today in NetSuite. All right, so this would be the same chart of accounts. So the nice thing about adaptive is we don't have to know SQL or any cryptic MDX or coding language. We're just gonna grab these accounts and we're gonna drag and drop them over the top here, okay? Now, we, right now we're measuring March as our comparative period. So let's go change our report period, assume we've closed our books for April, and then we'll just hit refresh. Cool. Now within so a couple of- like how S right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So notice there we populated five accounts across six months, but notice our comparative periods have all auto adjusted now to April deltas. Right. So it becomes a situation where you remove the tactical position of just the data gathering. It's taking you a day or two just to populate the package before we submit it, right? We're not telling the story. We're just gathering the data. We may not even understand what the story's telling. Something like this with a one-click refresh, and it's not just this one tab. It's the entire workbook from financials to metrics to operational metrics. Now we've put ourselves in a strategic position to really analyze the data and tell the story rather than being just data gatherers at that point, Agreed. right? So very, very powerful there. And then, of course, this would link back to uh, if you're deliverable ultimately to your consumers is via PowerPoint. You come back to a PowerPoint package. And the difference here, we would spend one time, link, you know, when you're doing PowerPoint today, you have to copy and paste each chart and each table of data to each respective sheet. You would do that one time via this linking mechanism. And it would keep that link essentially in perpetuity to that respective Excel package until you break that link. And then it becomes just a refresh with the PowerPoint side as well. Which is great to do if you're operating in capital, right? Oh, yeah. You're constantly making, you're constantly making presentations to these seeds. And it's like, well, I got to update this. All right, I got to update it. Spending half a day updating it. Well, I'm not playing with you. You're making your own time every month. You're, you're, you're going to really good at the right practice scenarios. Uh, and ideally, you may or may not be doing this. You may actually be having the data living in adaptive and using the adaptive HTML reports, the adaptive you do PL balance your cash flow, your dashboard. And you may or may not have this, but if this is if they have a format and like you're using that set board package, I think that's your package you use too, you can automate it. So this actually came from the user community about three years ago. Um, People are saying, hey, you know what? we're not getting away from Excel. We need you guys to build this out. So it just actually came out about 44% of the innovation in adaptive function of um, And so you have 3,800 other customers, tens of thousands of peers that are giving any feedback back into adaptive they've got to evolve uh, and bring 
All right. Why don't so the, navigate, the navigation pane and just kind of show like navigation uh, and have the just overall sheets and then versions yep. and then go through some revenue planning and stuff like that. Yep, that's exactly where I was heading. Perfect, perfect. All right. So adaptive is built on a concept called sheets. Okay, so this is the navigation pane up in the upper left hand side. Everywhere we would want to go into adaptive. And the nice thing here is you're not having to log out of one module to log into another. Right, it's all housed in one location. If we want to input data from a budget perspective, create a version for rolling forecast, create our dashboards, create reports, all in this one location. All right. Now, Adaptive is created on a concept called Sheets. You're very familiar with Excel workbooks and the challenge is if I've got five versions of a budget, I've got five books. Now, if I've got 10 different tabs of data across these five books. Now I'm trying to compare 50 tabs of data together. That's where the nightmare comes when I'm trying to do comparative analysis, right? Think of these sheets and adaptive as tabs in your Excel workbook, right? They're just different sets and types of data, whether it's operational in nature, financial in nature, personnel in nature, that we're planning and reporting by that aggregate up to respective plan operating plans, all right? Now we would also have sheets around assumptions. Assumptions would be variables or drivers that we're using within our formulas to create efficiency. Make one change to an assumption and see that ripple effect throughout the entire model, right? All right, so as an example of just some navigational aspects, let me give you a line of sight into one example of a financial statement. And the nice thing about adaptive is it's completely configurable, right? Nothing's really forced upon you out of the box. And you saw the slide that Sam showed in all the verticals we work in. The configurability and the nature of that configurability within the application allows us to be flexible across all of those verticals. Okay. So within this example of the PL statement, notice the light gray background. That's always going to signify a couple of things. A, it's uneditable, and B, it's most likely a consolidated view of the data set. Okay, so it's either uneditable or consolidated view. Right now, we're at the top of our org structure, so it's our consolidation of all our data sets. Notice I've got FY16, but I've got 17 by month, and I've also got 18 at an annual view. So we've got 36 months of data available on this one P&L statement. Okay, green values here always signify actual results. All right, so that's going to be the equivalent of your trial balance data that's been brought into Adaptive, essentially. If we wanted to get more granular into that historical data, we can quickly transition this sheet. Let's say we wanted a monthly view of 16. We can quickly just choose month and apply that, and the sheet's going to transition itself immediately to that monthly view of 16 to give us the trends and still maintain that 17 and 18 annual view here. Okay. From a version perspective, notice in the upper right-hand side, this is where we would house our versions. <clears throat> Now, when I was using Adaptive as an admin, because we were equity owned, I had multiple deliverables just from a budget perspective. I had my internal targets. I had targets to my equity group. But when the equity group bought us, they took all the cash off our balance sheet. Now we go get an operating loan. So I had a third target for my banking covenant responsibilities as well. Okay, So I would have three just budget targets for my reporting capabilities that allows me to quickly choose the version that I'm uh, reporting against, and then we reforecast it every month. So if we look at this three plus nine rolling forecast, the neat thing about adaptive is you can overlay these actual results depending upon your forecast requirements, okay? So this is a three plus nine forecast. We've overlaid our incurred actual results for the first three months of our operating year while maintaining our original assumptions for our operating budget for the remaining leading months of the operating year. Okay, This allows us to create that rolling type forecast process depending upon your forecast frequency. Okay. This also would uh, give you, and the nice thing here I should mention that the assumptions are independent by the version. Okay, so if at the midpoint, if you see your operating plans, you're really blowing it out of the water this year, and you need to make an adjustment in the back half of the year to your operating plans, you can do that via assumptions to take into account the additional growth that you're seeing this operating year that you may not have anticipated in your original budget plan. Okay. So there's multiple ways to create these different versions. And then from an org structure here, 
I mentioned we're at the consolidated view, so this would be at the corporate level. As I begin to dive down into my org structure, you begin to see the structure of my operating teams. Here I've got multiple entities in my sales groups and then, then uh, shared services teams. Are you doing any type of applications today around your shared services functions? Uh, yeah, we have, we have different departments. Correct. So essentially your org structure, so the access into the model is kind of driven by the org structure that you set up. So sales would go in and they, they may be just limited to see either their their team or the whole sales department. The IT, director of IT would see just their department. Um, they may or may not see salary level details as, as permissioning. Um, so you can kind of start getting more users in. So the org structure is one area and the versions are two foundational kind of parts of kind of how you so I do think up front at least we would want to do something where it's like, you know, we probably we like the departmental views, but we probably still have no licensing with finance and, and have finance be the ones to disseminate that information whether that's via Excel or some other stuff. Well tool. every um, every uh, subscription starts with 10 view only. Got it. Oh, um, you can do view only. Like yeah, that. so you can do a view only and oh, that's all ready, right? And so yeah. you can get people to come in and view only can allow people to put commentary in, but they can't change values. So oh, okay. So you can start getting some variance now, some collaboration going before it all democratizing kind of okay, who's changing number there? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yep. So that's where the work structure kind of comes in uh, in this plan here. Okay. Yep. And again, if you see where you came into the sales north, now you start seeing different color cells. Where you were talking earlier about all gray, yeah. now you start seeing white cells. Yep, which means, exactly. Which right. means you can actually edit those values in that yeah. sheet. Now they still have a formula because you see a, a triangle in the corner yeah. uh, indicating there's a formula behind it, but you've decided to let the user say, you know what, I will let them overwrite that if they want to. Okay. But the, the accounts, so unlike Excel, you see that account ribbon, account subscription revenue. You can actually understand what that point is. That equals G700 times D967. You actually can, and it will be your, that will be your terminology, not our terminology. But you go through like a drill through and stuff, and when it's down, you want to look down a number, right click, and then Excel Explorer, which you know, none of the other platforms have so it. Explore, right? So that view remind there's a Cognos has like a view like that with like the white cells when they're editable and not editable and yeah and it is just a little more really intuitive the green for actual versus black right. and if you change the number it turns black or blue and it has it in the database just some intuitive things mm -hmm. to help you understand and make it easier to use uh, and easier to wrap up in the web. All right, Brian, back to you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Not a problem. Not a problem. Great. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so how do we get some of that data? And let's go through some sheets like Salesforce data, right? How would we bring that Salesforce data and use that? So we went through the integration piece, right? So Salesforce data could be maybe used a couple of ways. One may be pipeline data. What's in my pipeline to help me forecast what's going to happen based on my sales reps team, right? So we bring this data in based on respective dimensions. Okay. In this case, the dimensions would be the account name or the opportunity name, <clears throat> including the stage that it's currently in and its sales cycle, as well as which product. Now, in our world, in adaptive, and each company is going to be a little bit different, we'll use a probability factor against that respective life cycle stage that it's currently in in its sales cycle. Right? And then we can use that to determine what type of forecast we're going to bring in for that ARR value. Okay, so if we look at this first one, Felton Incorporated, that's a closed one opportunity and they purchased product one. So if we explore the details of 250 ARR over a 12-month term and 2,000 of uh, services, we can begin to see the model aspect of how these values would be relative. So if I scroll to the right, we see that we would take a 250 value because it's a closed one opportunity, and now we would see our MRR, which obviously is the monthly recurring revenue, we see that value spread over the 12-month so, period. 
So sorry, can I just, this is something that's super important for us and something that we're trying to sort of build out. So I just wanted to, to pause here for a second. So can you yeah, close please. this for a second just so I can understand yep. how this is working? Absolutely. Right. So I think what you're telling me is that you bring in my pipeline from Salesforce, which is the area, it looks like almost to the left of that bar, almost one, two, three, four, five rows, right? Those five rows are from Salesforce. Correct? Correct. All of this data would be from Salesforce. Even the ARR and the close dates of the uh, assumed close okay, dates. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. But then I think what you yep. showed me is you can click on it and you can have the ability to forecast revenue by opportunity and yes. And adaptive retains that that information somewhere in the background. Exactly and right. It's all formula yep. driven. So based on the close date and the term and the probability, you're you, well. You're getting the, the ARR is dry and the term drives the MRR. Well, now, if right. you want to have a weighted ARR, a weighted MRR, then you just apply the the you have the formula apply the probability factor, and that probability may be the sales team probability. You may have a CFO, you may want to put in a CFO column and say, hey, you know, I want a finance adjustment yeah. because, hey, I love these guys, so guys, whatever, you know what, Lee, you bought last week as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so can, you go, can you go back to that um, <coughs> the, the view you had before I so rudely interrupted you? Yeah, Did absolutely. You know, or, yeah, the road is absolutely. absolutely. Yep. So keep in mind, well, this one is that. Just, just keep in mind this one. This is yeah. assuming a hundred percent, right? No probability. This is a closed one opportunity, so we would take all of it, right? On this. So let's say we, so we we sign very complex deals, right? Or like let's say the first one that's closed one is right. a two hundred fifty thousand dollar deal, but let's say half of it is a license that can be recognized radically over the term, so it's true MRR. But then the other half of it is events based, which let's just simplify it and say, I know I'm going to earn 100% of that revenue four months from now in, I don't know, uh, uh, July 20, 2018, right? Can we actually go in then and edit it so that part of it is, you know, whatever, half of it is the MRR piece, and the other half I can put in, chat in July of 2018 or whatever? That would be how we configure it yeah. based on your use yep. cases. So, uh, here in that situation, I would think you'd have probably two product lines. Yeah. But one is a subscription that is platform, another one could be subscription use based. Yeah. And right. then the use base could be either ad hoc, you're going you're gonna to model out that use by percentage. Yeah. Or because you could put months in there and say, hey, what month we're going to, I'm going to recognize it. Or you could have a use base based on you know, a, a certain, hey, Healthy for three months, and then there's like we just know how these go, yeah. and we're gonna have three or four, four dimensions that are gonna be based on that. It's kind of like think about a differentiation schedule, so, yeah. and so you have a certain. This is it's gonna be 100 percent now, planning, but it's gonna be pretty accurate based yeah. on what you want. Uh, okay. Very good. For, notice here you have the ability to split that row. Another option, Sam's exactly right, another option there. If you wanted to come as the finance team and do that adjust, adjustment, notice with this split row, I have now created a secondary piece of that. Maybe you could auto if change that. that again, Brad, that, that's really key functionality across the whole platform. So, yeah, yeah. so if you, you get split row will create a breakout of that opportunity. So you could immediately say, you know what? The first 150 is going to be product one, and maybe the remaining 100 would be product two. And then Sam's team, during your configuration, could write rules based on the recognition that link back to the specific product. So and that product could so then drive how the spread is. So one of the things we're doing in Salesforce is really pushing uh, our quoting to be, so we're, we're instituting TPQ, which is the old steel rep in Salesforce, right? So what we're gonna do is have the opportunity is going to be made up of specific SKUs, right? And it's gonna have all the SKUs in Salesforce beneath it. So I guess my question is, 
instead of doing a split row, could you build it where when the opportunity gets pulled in, it pulls in all the specific SKUs, which then have specific rules set up as to how those SKUs are recognized, right? So our, our MRR is specifically into one SKU. And so I know, okay, that SKU comes in, bam, I know it's going to get projected out like this. My use case stuff is going to be a different SKU. Bam, I know when that comes in, that's going to be use case and I have to sort of populate that based on, you know, whatever I want to do. Yeah, it's not in this example because it, there's it's fair enough, one, yeah. one line SKU ops. But if you have standard, hey, you know what, just, just the import, we're going to configure the import to the, to the sheet yeah. and, and have that aligned uh, that way. And then, <laughs> then we dimensionalize based on that SKU is going to have that, that MRR and it can handle it differently. Yeah, too. You may sure. No, no, it absolutely does. And signing date may be, okay, we're cash flowing 100% or 100% of the subscription and we're getting use based cash flow uh, 30 days after it actually happens on the on that. Yeah. I think one of the things, and this is probably more discussed with the two of us versus everyone on the phone, but you know, as we go and we're implementing CQQ, one of the things we talked about is building some of this function, trying to get our implementation partner for CP2 to build some of this in Salesforce, or sorry, in NetSuite. And I don't know that that's, to, I guess it's a conversation yeah, for, it's for all of like what you have what you've seen users do, because at the end of the day, if the reporting is going to be terrible on NetSuite regardless, I don't want, I'd rather save the implementation money and invest in a tool like this that will sort of work, but build it out in Salesforce. Have all the information in Salesforce. Let's stop there from an implementation perspective on CPU, yeah. and then let's use that the rest of that implementation money on something like this, which sort of you know, and then we'll use NetSuite as in our true just our general yeah. ledger system yeah. record, which right. is I think how people end up. In other words, I don't want to build an accounting system. It's not a reporting analytics system. Yeah, and so it's not built that way. And that's what I think I need, you need to determine in terms. So I apologize. No, you're pretty. You got it. You're, you're, that's our yeah, so that that's a great use case, and you can see that that the split. Say you 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 budget consulting dollars in OpEx or G and A, and then you say you know I know three hundred thousand dollars consulting or legal fees, but then you say you know I'd rather actually do it by firm. But you only have one GL account perhaps for legal fees, but you want to budget based on either ad agency or yeah. or thing, and so you have to do the split, and it's not polluting the rest of the model. And the rest of the department's models and stuff like that. Yeah, no. Um, so every one of those levels would have a, for the right. So, Grant, why don't we go to something? Well, go into something that's more of an OpEx, just to give an, an idea of kind of how sheets work across like HR personnel or yeah, expenses. So, so sheets then become the certain sheets are available to all levels. Yeah. And so this might be an OPEX uh, expenses for um, how the sales north is going to do it. Um, but every department probably has some training. Every department probably has maintenance. Every department has yeah. phone and legal and professional. Okay, you're not rebuilding every every account, every sheet. There's, there's one sheet in the background. But every those departments that need to have capital, it's all capital. You know, sheets and such. Okay. That's exactly right. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. And just as an idea of those assumptions, so assumptions could be used across multiple ways, right? Some of these would be global in nature. These may be things like the merit increase or 401k match rates or participation rates, right? Other type of assumptions, if you're operating in multiple states, you're going to need the tax rates for these multiple states. If you want to add a headcount, you just choose the state and it automatically pulls the respective tax rates, right? No, Healthcare no, plan no, options, no. right? Yeah. And just and different it types of things. Some people may just budget as a percentage of revenue, yeah. which will be yeah. percentage yeah. of labor, yeah, exactly. and just say, but other they, you know, different people cap out, and there's other things to do that might be smarter, and that different people have different benefit plans, the family versus the country, single and stuff, and there's, there's a trade off. Yeah. So people, but the flexibility is there, and then, once you set the dimension for family versus single versus like spousal coverage and stuff, then you 
those you upload know, your agent from the HRS system from that work, workforce now, and you got all the data. Um, you should right. do it by employee. Yeah, you do it by employee. You can you do it by employee. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can. If, if, well, yeah. if, 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 if we can get a common time, do you guys have a hard stop, or do you guys have, and I don't know, Brad, what your bandwidth is, but I've got about yeah, I can go about. Yeah, I can go probably 10, 15 more. I got to call it uh, 10, 30 okay. my time. So I can go a little longer. Yeah. Why don't we keep up? Why don't we bounce over to personnel? Okay. Yep. Yep. Not a problem. Not a problem here. All right. Yep. So this would be an example of one one department or level business units personnel sheet, right? So this model here is made up of three entities, right? Multi, uh, multiple operations globally, and we're down to one respective business unit. So this would be our list of employees, right? So we have employee names. We were talking about the states and use adding those into assumptions. So if we add, <laughs> so if we add a new hire, these are where those states would be located here, right? So if we add a new hire here, we can do that a couple of ways. We can just hit the plus sign and say new hire. Right. Or we can take an exit. And this will always happen to me is what if we just add three new hires? It would kind of be a hassle if I had to add them one by one or I could just start copying the new hire row when I'm sitting with my business units that want to plan headcount. Right. So multiple ways to enter that headcount data. Uh, here would be the healthcare plans based on the value would be pulling from the healthcare plans that we had in our assumptions. And then we can determine whether it's an hourly roll or a uh, annual figure, uh, hourly or annual here, and then the salary amounts. Now, this would be a modeled sheet because we're using values at an annual rate, and we're determining the percentage that they'll be recognized over a length of time, right? So this, do you have anybody that may be responsible over a few different departments? Maybe 50% of their time is spent on the services side and 50% yeah. of their time is spent on sales ops. Okay. Yeah. So this, is a, this is a great example of being able to create that allocation of payroll cost without going through an allocation rule writer that would run it from an allocation out to an end. This will be direct cost of allocations to these respective uh, payroll, salary and wage lines, and benefit lines. Okay, so William Clark here, notice his home department is the Sales North department. But in this example, in Q1, he's going to spend 40% of his time on Sales South, 30% of his time on Sales North, and 30% of his time on Sales East. And then beginning in Q2, he's going to go back to his regular split of time at 40 to Sales South and 60 to Sales North. But if we review the details, of how these values are going to be recognized back through the formulas that Sam was mentioning earlier to our expense statements, we can begin to get an understanding of how that spread would flow back across to our uh, expense and P&L statement. So if I scroll to the right and we begin to see our operating year of 2018. Now, I think what's important to note is notice all of these items that we're measuring here are considered accounts. Okay, you can create any number, unlimited number of custom accounts in Adaptive. As we create these accounts, they are now usable in Adaptive to be displayed on dashboards. They can be used when we write formulas. They can be used on our HTML reports. And, and for instance, if we wanted to now create a business rule that says, let's plan office supplies at $60 times every head in each department, we could now create that rule and formula and adaptive because we have an FTE account that's going to aggregate the number of employees in each department here. Okay. So these are just some examples of the type of accounts that we've chose to measure in this model around payroll and headcount. Yours may be different, but this is a great display of 30 or 40 different type of accounts that you can use to measure your personnel values and headcount aspects. Okay. So here we're going in, we're starting to measure the monthly value. We see that it's only taking 40% from a headcount perspective, a raw count of employees, but it's also only taking 40% of his salary and then the respective benefit cost flow with that. And remember we had that three, we had that 3% merit increase as well, triggering in the fourth month of the year. If we go over to April, we see that 3% merit increase is automatically triggered as well. So all of the associated costs lift 
with that merit increase trigger as well. So, so can you pull in, like, if you go back, can you pull in, like, furniture and apartments, like, let's say we want to look at, you know, what they were paid, more from, like, an HR planning perspective. So one of the things we struggle with right now is I have a census, if you will, that my HR money can even excel, and workforce now is the best from a, um, a reporting perspective, right? So, you know, we, I had to have my, head of HR basically go in and create six different planning docs for each department head and say, guys, here's your salary. Now, what our CEO wanted was each department had to get 2016 comp, 2017 comp. Okay, now fill in what you think 2018 comp would be. So is that something you can replicate in here in terms of, okay, pulling data from, okay, 2016, can you do multi-year sort of comp planning on this? Absolutely. Yeah, and so yeah. I don't know if we have it right here, but so this, this is an info sheet right here. Um, yeah, exactly. You could take and actually have then a, this would be driving a, uh, like regular expense plan sheet. So the expense for this department, now sales know, has, right, so here's FY17. If you want to bring FY16, you just go in and click and add in FY16. But could you see it by person? Sorry. So like every person you said, okay, here's your salary, here's the here's the here's the personnel on the left side, here's the salary from sixteen, here's the salary from seven, you know, like that kind of stuff. And we could not, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think he has so we have, have so here's personal report. So here's the reporting. So here's the different people, here's the actual sort for the March, here's the working budget. I guess. And we just have to say, okay, here's the actuals for 2016, here's the actual 2017, actual 2018. Here, if you want to see all the people on a, a personnel sheet, I mean, and, and the multi-year, so just, just add the comment yeah. in, okay. into the sheet okay. um, and pull the data. Right. Yep. Multiple ways to do that. Right. Yep. Oh, my yep. thing is. We don't pull, we don't have people on that street. We don't have their salary information. But you don't need the people. Yeah, it's coming you're you're totally, yeah, you're, but you have your dollars. You, you still put the actual dollars by department over, and those people will be mapped in here. So you oh, still have so that. So that, 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 that okay. You still get to the intersection, but you plan by people, but you account by department. And so now you can do that. And so back into the personnel sheet, you also can have like new hires. And prioritizing, okay, when's the person hire going to start? You may actually dream of I mean, everybody dreams that I'm going to find my report, my employee by March 1st because that's not my plan, but they may not actually show up. And then, easy as clicking that button, um, you're actually uh, in that. In that uh, right, go to the planning sheet, we have a date functionality. You can, uh, you can actually, uh, right here, you've got the start and end date. I mean, this is really super, super. So you just click on, on the start next to end date, and you can change the date. So you know, I thought you were going to start today, but you know what? The person's going to start uh, in June first instead. Yeah, no. And all the calculations are de are dependent on that date. And you know, somebody's leaving, and they can't they give their notice. So they're in two weeks. So they're in six months. Whatever they're retiring, you just put the end date out there, and all calculations are driven off that form. Based on based on their salary. Yeah, based on the rate, based on all the benefits, all the other things that are associated with the yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we should be able to. One, two, uh, yeah. pending versus approved. Yeah, that's huge. So everybody's got their wish list, whether it's capital, personnel. We, we see this a lot more in capital sheets, but yeah. basically you put a problem and they say, like, hey, let's have a, everybody can be a wish list. You're not all getting all your hours, but then you can sit in the management team meeting and say, hey, okay, every department asks for four people. Who's getting two, who's getting one, who's getting zero? Um, but you put this little, this little thing in there and put the list in there, uh, pending, approved, rejected, and only the approved one actually impacts you, you know. No, that's, that's, we're managing all that right now, just to make so. Absolutely. Yeah, they survive, yeah. but not, uh, again, laborious, not collaborative, okay. no on trails. You can you can notes in here, say why you approved it, comments and such, uh, all that. 
Yeah, and to that point, that's a big differentiator. So notice, you know, Sam mentioned earlier the purple icons here. This is an expense sheet. Gray areas, uneditable. White areas, you can edit. He mentioned the purple icons always signify there's logic driving that value. Anytime you were to run across a red icon, that would signify there's a note. And the difference to your environment today, you know, if you leave a note in your Excel sheet, you're leaving that note on E32 and it never leaves cell E32, right? And adapted, if you leave a note, you're leaving the note on the value. That gives that note the ability to travel with that value. So if we review a consolidated number and drill down, you'll eventually get to the note if you're drilling down into sales north data set. If you run a variance report on sales north, this note will always travel because it's with the value. It's not relative to the cell or the intersection of March and maintenance here, right? It's on the value that you place that note in. And Sam is talking about... Pivoting over to uh, reporting. Are you yeah, want to do a little value changing and such and just say, hey, do you, so, so yeah. one of the things that people do in budgeting is either they budget the end of the year value, but they want to spread it back. And they want to say, hey, yeah. you know what? okay, the part of people, just, just put your end of year values in, and we're going to spread it based on either last year's seasonality or a different uh, FTEs or different plans and such. So here it's, it's very nice to say, hey, you know what? You can you see he put twenty two hundred in and he did hit copy forward. Okay, and then the year. Yeah, I don't know if this is like hard coding. Right, exactly. Yeah, you, you, yeah, and you can do it multiple ways. And Sam mentioned earlier at the start the real time calculation engine. Notice every value on this sheet that's dependent upon that change is already waiting for me to hit save, right? There's no batch processing you may have worked with in the past with some legacy applications to make your changes. You've got to make 30 changes and upload them all. Not the case with adaptive, right? It is immediate calculations once we make that change. So one way to enter that value could be to hard code it, right? You could just plug that value in. We could also write a formula just like you would write it in Excel. You know, we could say, you know what, let's just do 20 times 50 here, right? We could write that formula and push that to the end. So there's multiple ways you can input this data. We could reference back in time to grab FY16's value, say time equals this minus 12, and it would reach back to January 2017 to grab that value, okay? Or maybe if we're looking at this and we say, you know what, let's just give them 30K for a little lift for this year. We can enter that at the annual side. Now we have options of how we want to spread these values back, right? Maybe manufacturing in a retail environment is running 13 weeks, right? If you're running your business on specific days of the month, or percentage of revenue, percentage of uh, cost of goods sold. Those are customized assumptions that could be created as well. In this case, I'm just going to spread that 30K back exactly how the 26K came in the prior year and hit apply. Right. So multiple ways. And then you could come in, you know, we could even say 26 on that and then say, you know what, give me a 5% lift on these first months. And then I could increment that value via a percentage or a straight value there. Right. So multiple ways. And Sam was talking about audit trails. And now that I've made some changes in this line, there are multiple ways to do audit trails. Right. So this would be an example of an audit trail at an account level, one account. Right. Maybe you went home last night and that value was twenty four thousand. You came home this morning. You came into the office this morning. It's 30K. Well, how does that happen? Right. Who had the change get made? But we have the audit trail capabilities. This is an example of one account line but you can also create and run an audit trail based on a time span that would include all data imports and exports throughout the application. So here you get a timestamp, you get who made the change, old values and new values. And you can tell I use this line pretty, pretty frequently to show that audit trail there. <laughs> yeah. So it's a multi but multiple ways to input data and that gives you a line of sight into the audit trail. All right, now from reporting, let me give you a quick idea of some reporting. So the nice thing here is quick access to reports, right? We have four folder types with reports. One of them would be favorites. Favorite reports would be the reports that you run most frequently, and it would be each individual person in your org. They would be for each individual person's login because each person potentially running different reports, right? We also have private reports that maybe you're testing some what-if scenarios. 
you don't want to share that information. You would have to grant them access. And then you could also have a report repository for your entire organization. So any items in your favorites would be quick access with a one click. So I could one click that report and it's going to immediately pull that up because it's in my favorites list, right? So this would be an example of just a typical OPEX month end expense report, right? A variance report for the month. Notice we've got some conditional formatting here, but the neat thing about writing reports in adaptive is they can be used across the entire organization. So we've created this report once and we're at the uh, aggregated or consolidated view of our data set. But if I wanted to review any department within my org structure here, I can choose that and just hit refresh. So to Sam's point earlier, if I'm a responsible for sales north, I wouldn't see the org structure tree in here like you would on the finance team. I would only see sales north in my level tree here because that's the only security rights that I have within the application. Right. Now, William Clark, as we saw earlier, he may have sales north, sales south, and sales east because his time is split across all three of those groups. So he would need line of sight into these three departments or business units within our org structure. So notice here, we've got some collaboration happening as well. So you can pick and choose where you want these notes to be placed. Typically in finance, we like to see them in the columns. If we scroll down here, we see we've got a Mills account that's you know small variance, but to someone in Sales North, it's a large variance. So we've got the VP of Sales asking what's going on here, right? Today, that may take a call to your AP team, right? AP's got to do a data dump, put it into a pivot table, email it off, still don't understand what this means it turns into a phone call right but if we bring the transaction level values in here whoops we bring that transaction level detail in behind that 2400 an end user begins answering their own questions right again removing some of those tactical items non-strategic items that we work through in the finance group today again just you know, a simple efficiency measure where an end user begins answering their own question. Now the conversation may no longer be about the variance. Now it may be, are these lunch team outings around business development opportunities in the future, right? It can change the nature of our conversations and uh, how we're reviewing our data sets. Okay. All right, and notice that note. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to show you. Remember, we talked about that note traveling with the value. It, a, it shows up as a footnote, but it also shows up within that value if I explore that value here. And that's where that note would be that would be traveling with that value. And from an actuals result, all of these values are drillable and explorable, just like they would have been within the application as well. So this is telling you it's coming from general ledger values. So yeah, let me build one from scratch for you just to give you an idea. So this gives you line of sight into the folder views. I was talking about favorites. These would be the reports that I run most frequently, right? Shared reports. This could be a report repository for all of your business units have a folder. This way you're guaranteed everyone's coming to the same spot looking for their reports rather than having one off reports on individual machines, right? How would you use the build reports? Say, say that again, I'm sorry? How easy is it to build reports, which I think you're showing us here? I mean, the that's point 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 point. Point. Yeah, this is drag and drop, point and click. So essentially, yeah, that's 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 the canvas And yeah. like you saw in Office Connect, you now see the same variables on the left. It really is what everything is in your model. Accounts, what time periods, what levels. Yeah, so all of these, this is the same exact element pane or structure that we would have seen in Office Connect. We would see this same element pane and structure building a dashboard. You would see this same exact element panel if you're writing formulas within Adaptive. Okay. We were talking about those assumptions. Right, exactly. And this is like HTML reports. So this would be, this retains its, uh, I mean, it's really just drag and drop. And so any account, whether it's a statistical account, whether it's a financial account, whether it's a, med like a, a calculated account where, the ratio of revenue per FTE or something like that. And so he's just dragging over values and such and said, okay, here we go, and I'm putting it in different positions that I want to, to work. Um, okay, so he's got his accounts, and he's got to say, okay, what time period do I want to be looking at? 
what, what do I want? Do I level? Do I want to be able to have it as both a, a parameter, be able to have some control through? Similar to both. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that's very That's exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's a big pivot table. And the simplicity of drag and drop, if you think about how much ad hoc reporting is coming through your groups today, you know, that's what keeps us buried, right, is the ad hoc reporting. To be able to step into an application right like this without having to write SQL coding and to be able to quickly drag and drop the items I want and to be able to show it as a value or a percent to be able to create the conditional formatting rules for our flux analysis, right, and display that data very quickly. So I spent, what, maybe a minute and a half here developing that, and this would be considered an ad hoc report that I started from scratch about 10.14 or 10.13 there. Now we've got a fully built P&L statement for Q1 by the month, by the quarters, right? Very efficient, can be used across any department, again, just like any other report that we can standardize and build. And these values are still live and drillable to go right back to the application. To be, like if your executive was reviewing this and they say, okay, I see product group A, we're planning 2.1, but what's the contribution? I can begin to drill back into that value and explore the contribution by my respective operating units uh, globally. And within those units globally, now I can begin to understand how each sales team is going to develop that plan and get back into my actual formulas of how we build up to 200K in the period of January 2018. Uh, it gives you full interconnectivity to begin to understand from a product perspective, which if you're planning it at the granular level of down to specific products, down to specific customers, you really see the ability to get to the most granular level of your detailed plans by customer down to specific products in this example. Right. And the, the other thing I would show you here is what if you're at month end, right? And I'll wrap with this. And we wanted to measure with your executive team and they view this chart and they say, wow, look at that. We, and I should have flipped my signs here. We, you know, we overperformed 1.25 on just product group A and Q1. That's huge. You know, how was this performance across all of our business units? Right? Would be a hassle if I had to go in here and review each respective business units. But if I can turn around and pivot on just that one account line and get that understanding of how my, all of my operating units perform to drive that 1.25, it becomes a much more efficient process to be able to analyze my data sets by just pivoting on an existing report there. And then you can drill right back to the unfiltered original report from that aspect as well. Okay. Okay. All right. So I, I kind of need to pop up. I got a call with Doug coming up here. Doug, yeah. Doug, Doug, Doug's, a, Doug's a big guy, the VP guy, so I probably don't want to be too late on that one. <laughs> but uh, any, anything else we can show you? Any uh, any other aspects that we haven't hit that uh, it's important to you? No, I think um, I think this is super helpful. I think you know we're sort of on again here, but um, no, I think I can.